It's time for Mac Geek Gab, and I'll bring us our quick tip of the week because I rediscovered that the Finder, yes, the Mac OS Finder, with no third-party extensions necessary, will let you batch rename files. It's true. It's a little tricky because it doesn't work the way my brain wants it to work. You highlight all the files, and then you go to the file menu, or you right-click, and you choose Rename. When you are renaming multiple files, you get a little dialog that pops up and it says rename finder items and you can replace text. You can add text. You can remove text and you put in the string that you want it to find if you're replacing text and the string you want to replace it with. And even better, it uses the first file in the list as an example to show you what your end result will look like. So you actually get to see this in real time. It's the coolest thing. I love that it's in there, especially since it's probably not used very much. More quick tips like this, plus your questions answered today on Mac Geek Cab 1032 for Monday, April 8th, Trading Cards for Grown Ups Day 2024. <laughs> Greetings, folks, and welcome to Mac Geek of the show where you send in or we provide quick tips like that. You send in your questions. We try to provide the answers. You send in cool stuff found. We share all that together. The goal being that each of us learns no less than five new things every single time we get together or we relearn things we've forgotten about, like that opening quick tip, which I know that I knew in the past because the find and replace strings or things familiar to me. <laughs> uh, sponsors for this episode include linkedin.com slash MGG, where you can go and post your first job for free, and BB Edit from barebones.com with integrated notebooks, chat GPT support. There's so much in there. We'll talk more about all that in a little bit. For now, back here and well-rested in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here and never left in South Dakota. <laughs> I'm Adam Christensen. And we are flying in the uh, the missing man formation, as it were, today, because Pete is actually out doing the flying, so uh, schedules were not to work. So, Adam, you and I are, uh, I think this is the first time you and I are doing this, uh, just the two of us? I think. I can't remember. I, I'm, I can't I'm getting either. older, and these things escape me, but I <laughs> thought we maybe did one. Yeah. I, maybe I, I, Pete did swoop in at the last moment on that there one. Was we one, talked about doing one. We, there was one we thought we were going to do uh, uh, solo, uh, solo without Pete, and uh, and then, and then yeah, the, the, the schedules just magically worked. So uh, I don't yep. think that's going to happen today. I don't think we're going to see a surprise Pete appearance. But you never know. Yeah, with Pete, you never know. Uh, and I want to thank you and Pete for shouldering the load last week. I, I know there's visual and audible evidence that I participated in Mac Geek Gab 1031. I have very little recollection of it, given the limited amount of sleep that I had coming in. The, the one thing I remember about doing this, I do remember doing the show, uh, was that every 10 minutes or so I'd feel like, oh, okay, now I'm like awake and online. Ah, oh, now I'm great. I'm good. And then 10 minutes later, be like, no, now I'm online. It's like, no, no, no. I don't think I was ever online. Alas, thank you. It was, uh, it was, I listened back. It was like, I thought there was good stuff in the episode. So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I enjoyed yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's good. Even All right. If you don't remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember now. Like, I, I, I heard it. It's like, okay. I wasn't even like on anything. It wasn't, you know, there wasn't, there was it was just lack of sleep, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, PC Unix in a thread in our Discord, uh, PC Unix mentioned the idea of having pinned notes in the Apple Notes app, and Steve Hammond was like, "I didn't even know this was a thing, Dave. You need to put this in the show." I agree. If we've never talked about pinned notes in Notes before, then yes, now is the time. I. We use this here, right? With with Mac Geekab, we have several shared notebooks, which perhaps is another quick tip that there are shared notebooks. 
We have several shared notebooks amongst the three of us. And at the top of uh, two of them, the prep notebook and the, the current show notebook, uh, we have some pin notes that we use for various things. And it's awesome to be able to just go. Like I have my, it, it, I don't know if I've talked about it on the show, but certainly pre-show, I have my pre-flight and then of course post-flight checklist because there's too many things to do now with all the stuff that we're doing. I, I would forget. And in fact, we added a new thing to the pre-flight checklist just this morning because I kept forgetting. Thank you, Zoe. And thank you for the bacon. Uh, so yeah, these pin notes are are fantastic. And you just, uh, I think you just right click a note and choose pin it, right? Yep. Yep. I'm sure there's something in the menu and I'm sure there's a shortcut too, but that's usually how I do it. Yeah, there is pin notes. There's also lock notes. Uh, yeah, oh, that's so lock- Pete can't mess with them. No, it, no, it, that <laughs> the lock note one. is the it password protects it. Yeah, I wish there was a way to lock it so Pete <laughs> couldn't mess with it. That would be great. Yeah. Well, if you don't give him the password, he can't mess with it. Oh, that's true. That's <laughs> fair. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I want to. I want. I want like a, a now. Yeah I, know, yeah, I know what we're talking about. Like I, you can't edit it. I, 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 it's not so much for Pete, although it, it is, um, but also me, <laughs> like, you know, sometimes you just like your, your cursors where you don't think it is and you start yeah, yeah. typing. It's like, oh wait, crap. I didn't want to edit that, that note, like my pre-flight checklist. I only want to change that when I want to change it, y- you know? So yeah. 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 Anyway, um, that's the, uh, that's the, the, the pin notes and other things in notes too, evidently. So, yeah, yeah. yep. Yipper, what do we so, have next, Adam? I was going to say Michael has one for us. He says, your advice is excellent. Don't get caught. Well, yeah, we, that's good, good advice. He says, he would also like to add this. Don't get lost. Oh. He says, here's a quick tip about using the iPhone camera as an aid to not get to not getting lost. Once upon a time, oh, it's the story. I, I was at a meeting at a local hospital designed as a truly enormous maze on five stories. Our team... We're meeting in a department far from the main entrance. We received a message that colleagues who had traveled from another city had just arrived and were waiting at the main reception. I was volunteered to go fetch them. Finding reception was no problem. It was clearly signposted throughout the building, but I would never ever be able to, would I ever be able to find my way back? And it would be especially embarrassing to take visitors to an interminable ramble all on an interminable, is that, I'm not familiar with that word, ramble all around the hospital. So this is the quick tip. On my long walk to reception, each time I passed through a junction, I would turn around and snap a photograph back down the corridor I had just taken. Once I had collected my visitors, all I had to do was step back through the photographs one by one in reverse order, and they guided me straight back to our meeting. Our visitors were so impressed. That's that's smart. I like it. I I have made a in scenarios like that. I have made a habit of as I walk. I haven't used my camera to do it, but I just turn around and look because I know that I like the view that I have going the way I'm going is not the view I will have going the other way. So I I use that to just set some visual memory of like, oh yeah yeah, yeah I I remember this. I remember this. I remember this. Um, but taking a picture that I actually have and can see would be even better especially given the whole memory thing i don't know if it if it would work on multiple floors and this is just coming to me in the back of my mind and i've never (sighs) used this feature yep but doesn't the compass app have like a wayfinding thing in it yes it it yes i i haven't used it this way either yeah how do you turn on the wayfinding i don't remember i think you can use it with the watch and stuff too but i I doubt it would work i think it's just on the watch altitude wise right right and and yeah is the gps tight enough to work in indoors in a building probably yeah (laughs) but i think it's just on the watch um because i'm not i have the compass app up and i don't see oh maybe it is only on the watch yeah 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 i did just notice something about the compass app having it up is I tapped on the screen thinking maybe that'll get me more options and I swiped and, you know, did other things. But if you tap on, if you aim the compass in a certain direction and you tap on it, it'll mark that. So at the moment I am facing 287 degrees. Okay, great. 
If I then turn the compass, it shows me the gap between where I set and where I was. So I, you know, it's like it's red. The gap is red. And it says, no, if you want to aim 287, well, you're off of that now. Better go back onto it. That's cool. It's, yeah, I know. Yeah, there's uh, all kinds of little tips in there. I, I'm wondering what else yeah, the I can level. find. There's the level, but that's not in the Compass app, is it? No. Is it that's, now in Measure? I think it's in the Measure app. Yes, that's right. Yep. Which is perhaps even yet another quick tip if you didn't know that it was there. Um, yeah, there's that that level app. And that's a fun game to play, to hold the phone and see if you can make the screen turn green Yeah, in the level app. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Lots of things. All right. Yep. All right. Uh, Alex has a uh, a quick tip for us. He says, uh, I thought maybe sharing a word of advice about uh, for users of the Apple Calendar app to help be better prepared for birthdays of their important uh, people in their lives. Uh, Apple Calendar apps provide a convenient feature for events, the second alert on iOS or multiple alerts on the Mac. I'd also like to use it for birthdays of the people closest to me to make sure that during busy days, I prepare a nice and accurate gift or message in advance and to be reminded as well in the morning on the day of the event, ensuring myself from accidentally and unintentionally recalling about the matter too late. However, if you go to settings to change the alert of the automatic contacts birthdays calendar and try to add a second alert for its events, you'll see that this particular calendar is deprived of the second alert feature i have come up with a manual workaround in the calendar app on the mac double click on a given birthday event then click the middle gray area of alerts and a plus sign and a circle will appear this will give you multiple alerts on the mac unfortunately that doesn't work at all on the iphone you can't add the second alert uh, and the alert created on the mac doesn't fire on the iphone either this is truly limited just to the mac um but uh, at least it allows you to do the second alert, which you could set for, you know, several days before or whatever you want. So I like that. That's a good one. That's Alex. a great tip. Yeah. yeah. It also reminds me of, I, I can't think of the examples right now, but I, I do often run into this thing where there's certain things you can only do on the Mac and not on the iPhone. Like yep. That disparity comes up yep. more often than, I, than I, I would think at this point. Yes. Yeah, I, 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 uh, especially, yes, more often today than, yes, than I would expect to. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. Because why? There's so much that's shared between the two, like code bases that are shared between the two of these apps. Why, why do we have these, these things? And then, yeah, yeah. and then, and then we have, you know, cool stuff like, the battery name in the finder that's like who even knew <laughs> yeah. i think i think there are multiple third-party apps to do that oh yeah there's like, a ton, there yeah, are a ton. it's right there <laughs> like like how many other yeah. people don't know how many other people have, have either don't know about it or have forgotten about it I don't know. yeah i mean the classic thing though is like the thing in the finder is pretty basic i mean it does a nice job but like if you need extreme renaming with like a lot of options there's a lot of great third-party apps for that that i mean Correct. Like, Apple Correct. always leaves that little hole. They kind of cover the basics, and then if you need more, yep. you know, yep. developers, yeah, developers, right? Yeah, you're <laughs> you're right because like there, the, like it doesn't let you sequentially rename things, or at least not that I know of. Yeah, you yeah. can. Let's see, you can add text to it in the Finder, and you can change the format. Uh, oh, you can do a counter. Oh. It yeah. will let you do a counter with the format thing. So, okay. And you could ha even have it with the date. You can have, you can timestamp the uh, the files. That's really. Yeah, it has some nice options. But again, I, I think there's these extreme ones that just like yeah. people who just are dealing with massive amounts of documents need yeah, yeah. to do weird things and we other conditionals things. and like Correct. if it's this then that you know that sort of thing yep that makes sense it's not gonna yeah, do yeah. any of that stuff it's not gonna do that but it it it's yeah mess around with it like I I. It's this is one of those things that's I believe good to have a working knowledge of so that when you need to do a thing, you know, ah, I know where to go. And 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 so I, I suppose in a meta sense, that's kind of what this show is all about, because a lot of the things we share aren't like necessary in the moment, but it's like plant the seed in your head. 
plant the seeds yeah. with us, folks. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uncle Jamie has another seed. If we yes, I do. Yeah. He says, drag a document's title bar icon to move or share like the finder. The small proxy icon appears to the left of the document's title in the title bar when a when the document is open in the app. For purposes of dragging, it has the same effect as dragging the document's icon in the finder. This is especially useful to attach the document to an email message you also have open. Yep. Yep. Super that, handy. Yeah. I, I always use the trick too for figuring out the path by like right clicking on that thing. And I think it'll show you the path, right? Oh yeah. Remember it'll show it? you the path. That's right. Yeah. 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 That's to right. where that file is. Yep. 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 Yeah. It's, uh, I, I love things like this. All right. But yeah. Just treating uh, that folder thing occurs in a lot of places. There's a lot of places where you can just drag the, folder the represent representation of that thing in an app and it will behave like you just grabbed it from the finder so yep. i think that's just a good general tip like doesn't even have to be the title bar folder like you know you're just looking at a document app or something like that or you're in files or wherever Where, wherever yeah yeah kiwi graham in our live chat uh, discord macgeekup.com slash discord uh, says uh, he believes that icon is technically called the proxy icon which that works for me sure I'll, I'll call it that um i uh i do this occasionally and the last time i did it i i figured oh i need to share this again i think we've talked about it before but with current versions of mac os we have this whole permissioning thing for where apps get access to things like your microphone or full disk access or accessibility especially and really those last two, full disk, full disk access, whew, I can say Mac Geek Gab in my sleep, <laughs> as I proved last week, cannot say full disk access without really working on the enunciation. I got to make that funny face that theater people make. Um, but, and accessibility, those two are often in the way. And by that, I mean... I'll go to do something in an app and it'll say, oh, you need to re-enable. It doesn't say re-enable, but I know I've enabled it before and somehow it got turned off. So it's like, you need to enable this. And then you sometimes you got to quit the app and uh, relaunch it. And so I have found that when I am in that scenario and I have to go into, say, you know, system settings, privacy and security, um, you know, and then let's say accessibility. If I have to go in there for one app, I look at everything that's there and turn back on the ones that I know that I want on because they turn off. And then while I'm there, I also go to full disk access and do the same thing. And I have gotten in the habit, you know, talk about alert blindness or security blindness because this is such a cumbersome thing in the moment. I have gotten in the habit of just turning on accessibility and full disk access for anything that shows up in that list, which means it asked for it. Now, obviously, I'm looking at the list as I'm doing it, and if there's something that seems questionable to me, maybe I won't turn it on or I'll I'll dig in deeper. But otherwise, man, like no bueno. Like I, I just I I wish I could say just grant this like it used to be. Please, like I'll take the blame. I <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, but you're a responsible computer user who knows what you're doing. I try to you know. Be. <laughs> like I, I, I understand I understand where this comes from because it comes from that place of you know if if they don't point it out to people they won't think about it so yeah. it would be yeah. nice to have that override I guess you know somewhere probably somewhere. bury that setting deep where most people wouldn't find it but yeah yes yeah even bury it deep that's right yeah default to on I'll go in and turn them off like I really wouldn't mind you know, even setting a monthly calendar thing. And maybe I should do that. But I, I find myself in there probably about that often is once a month. I'm in there and it's like, all right, just turn all the stupid stuff on. Like, because it drives me crazy. And another tip about that, when you go and, turn, you know, if, a, if an app asks you, hey, you need to turn this on or whatever, and you go and you turn it on, system settings will almost, and, and it might not even be almost, almost always tell you okay i've i've made this change but you have to quit and relaunch you know the app in question in order for it to be aware of this change that is not universally true 
System settings does not know whether an app is truly capable of refreshing itself enough in, in that way. So try it. Usually with accessibility and full disk access, you do not need, in my experience, you do not need to relaunch the app. For screen sharing, you absolutely need to relaunch the app. And that, of course, is the one that sucks the most when you're like in a Zoom call. It's like, <laughs> oh, can you share your screen? It's like, oh, crap, that got turned yeah, off. Yep. It's like, yep, well, I got to say goodbye. I'll be back, you know, so. Well, yep. imagine how fun it is when your IT department is the only people that can change that for you. Oh, my gosh. I didn't even <laughs> think about that. Oh. <laughs> I, I understand that 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 sounds awful. Is that, and, that yeah? And they and they will not grant it. Uh, in my case, for uh, is it team, team, Teams? No, what's Google's? Like, Google, Google Meet, Google Meet. Yeah. So I, I they're like, no, we're not giving the browser access to your camera because <laughs> oh. there's no app, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> we're that's, not granting uh, Chrome like full access to your camera. Couldn't they, I'm just thinking about like the right way to solve this problem. Couldn't they give you, couldn't they say, all right, you're going to use your screen. I guess it's really what right, it's, it's the screen scre sharing. They don't, they it's don't the screen. But what if, and I don't even know if this is possible, but bear with me here. What if they had a, like Microsoft edge and they designated edge as the browser for these teams meetings, right? Or Google yeah. meet or, you know, whatever. Yeah. For, yeah, yeah. I forget. Yeah. Google me and Google me yeah. and gave you, and this is the part that I don't know if it's doable, but it sure seems like it might be gave you a locked down Microsoft edge profile that only allowed it to use Google meet and nothing else. Right. So every time you launch edge, the only sites that you're allowed to visit with this profile are, you know, meet dot what google.com or right, whatever yeah, the yeah, URL yeah. is. And then would they feel better about this? Now, I don't know how to go about building that profile or if it's even possible, but it seems like there might be a browser you could do that with. And it, it's funny because now that you're saying that, I think they did figure out the solution because I think this came up originally because I was like, hey, I can't share my screen in these these uh, Google Meet meetings. And they're like, oh, yeah, well, no, we're not letting the browser do that. And I think my IT guy went and thought about it. And I think he figured out a way. And I, I now that you say profiles... Yeah, I think he figured out a way to like build some sort of specialized profile. Uh, that's good. That's good. That's good. Yeah. <sighs> All right, folks. Ever wonder how we keep our social media game so strong here in MGG land? Well, it's not just tech magic. It's about finding the right crew. Enter our sponsor, LinkedIn Jobs, the secret sauce behind snagging our social media and promotions ninja, Sadie, who's been crushing it here for three years now. Imagine scrolling through a digital world filled with over a billion professionals. That's LinkedIn for you. Not your average job board, but a treasure trove of talent waiting to be discovered. And let me tell you, finding Sadie was like hitting the jackpot on a slot machine. Except the odds are way better with LinkedIn Jobs. We posted our gig and bam, in less than 24 hours, we had quality candidates lining up like it's Black Friday. And the process? Easier than setting up a wireless router straight out of the box. No tech support needed. So don't get caught in the endless cycle of hiring mayhem. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash MGG. That's linkedin.com slash MGG to post your job for free Terms and conditions apply. Hiring is easy. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. Go linkedin.com slash MGG and our thanks to LinkedIn Jobs for sponsoring this episode. You ever find yourself tangled in code, craving a digital Swiss army knife to slice through the chaos? Well, our sponsor, BB Edit, is here wearing its superhero cape, ready to rescue those drowning in a sea of text. Imagine navigating your documents with the ease of a captain steering through calm waters thanks to BB Edit's new mini map palette. It's like having GPS for your code. And those moments when you're feeling lost, the cheat sheets are your trusty map guiding you through the murky depths of Markdown and beyond. Now, for my fellow developers, BB Edit's enhanced projects feature is like upgrading from a rowboat to a speedboat making your workflow smoother 
and faster. And with ChatGPT worksheets, it's like having a first mate who's fluent in conversational AI, ready to banter back and forth as you conquer the coding seas together. But wait, there's more. BB Edit's got this nifty trick up its sleeve. Repeat last command. It's the coding equivalent of an echo in a canyon, but way more useful. And for those venturing into data science, switching between virtual environments is as easy as changing your mind about which Netflix show to binge next. So don't get caught in the undertow of unmanageable text. Arm yourself with BB Edit and navigate the digital waves like a pro. Remember, in the world of tech, being equipped with the right tools isn't just smart, it's essential. Upgrade your arsenal at barebones.com and make text wrangling a breeze. And our thanks to BB Edit for sponsoring this episode. All right. Shall we uh, do some questions, Adam? Yeah. Andrew's having an issue. Okay. He, tell. <laughs> he okay. says, here's my issue. Well, I am having odd behaviors on my 2019 iMac, a 16 gigabyte, 3.6 gigahertz core i3. It has a one terabyte drive with only about 250 gigabytes used. There are three or four issues that cause problems. Number one, it attempts to use the Finder search result to use a Finder search result in the Finder, become non-responsive and having causing them to have to relaunch the Finder. Uh, number two is attempts to search in the Mail app result in the Mail app becoming non-responsive and having to force quit the Mail app. Number three is attempts to print any document to PDF using the print dialog bo box results in that in the app that created the document to become unresponsive. I'm, I'm seeing a theme here. Yeah, uh, Unresponsive and having to force <laughs> quit and restart the app. A workaround for this problem is to open in preview and then save the PDF file from there, and that works fine. Number four, attempts to tag a file with a color marker do not work. Troubleshooting steps that he's gone through are um, and have been done to resolve this issue resulted in temporary elimination of these issues, but they return in a matter of minutes or hours. So he's tried safe boot. Uh, he's tried running Titanium software, Titanium software's maintenance scripts, which is a great uh, set of yep. scripts, uh, and reinstalling Big Sur from the recovery partition by starting with Command R. Yeah. He says, I'm left, left wondering... If there could be some corruption in one or more preference files, but I have no idea which ones might be the culprit. So my first question is, what other repair actions should I take to attempt to resolve these issues on the current iMac and OS? And I think he's also somewhat wondering. Is it time to upgrade? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Do I need a new Mac? I, yeah, it, and that was that was sort of where the question came in. I think maybe the title of the the subject of the question was, you know, is it time to upgrade to M1? And I, like, I'll address that first. I, no, not necessarily. Like, I, it's, I mean, it's never a bad time, uh, except <laughs> yeah. that it is, right? Like, you know, you it's going to cost you money. All all of those things. I I don't. I I wouldn't. Well, listen, I had a 2019 iMac Intel here in the studio, similar to, to what he has. I think mine was a little faster than his, but not like not to the point where it would make a difference for the things he's talking about. And I would still be using that if it weren't, you know, lightning striked this past summer. Uh, you know, it's so I, no, I don't think this is the reason to upgrade Uh there's a few things I'd try if this were mine. I know you said you ran Titanium Software's uh, maintenance scripts. Titanium Software, the folks that make Onyx. Onyx, uh, yeah, that's the app. Yep, yep. I would, I would make sure that for this scenario, especially, that I would go into Onyx, go into maintenance, and turn on everything. And that includes rebuilding the mail index. It definitely includes rebuilding the spotlight index. There's something... Clearly something wrong with spotlight on this computer. Um, at least that's based, you know, you said you're sensing a theme here. It was like, yeah, same. Uh, right. right. Like, yeah. 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 Um, and, and, you know, you already did the big Sur reinstall over the top. That would have been sort of the next thing that I would try if I were there. Um, and failing all of that or having tried all of that because it seems like you might have kind of done the you know the obvious things for us which means 
either you've been listening long enough or you, you, you know, you learn these things on your own somewhere. Uh, I would, I, you know, open activity monitor and sort by CPU by, by, you know, uh, and make sure in activity monitor, you, you go to view all processes so that you're seeing the entirety of the system and see what it like, see what's, chewing your cpu in those moments where it's bogged down it is not uncommon for me this is, i mean i'm a, i'm dave and i'm a nerd uh <laughs> to, to run with activity monitor open just for these reasons so i can see what's going on or i use you know istat menus or or stats or you know one of those things that lives in the menu bar but it is sometimes even clicking on the menu bar is impossible in those moments because things are so bogged down. So having a window open with activity monitor already running, sorted by CPU, showing all processes, that can be really informative for troubleshooting th exactly this kind of thing. So um, that's, that's if I were there, that's what I would do. I don't know. What do you, what do you think, Adam? Uh, yeah, I mean... <laughs> So he says he's done a reinstall of Big Sur. Is that, I'd be curious if that's just an over-the-top like reinstall, or is that a complete wipe and reinstall? I mean, no, that's I think the that's the over-the-top. Yeah, that's the extreme option, and I don't know that you're there yet. Um, at the same time, too, I'm wondering because I, I still run a 2019 um, Intel Mac. I mean, right. mine's a 16-inch MacBook Pro, and I've got a Core i7 instead of an i3. Um, I'm curious why he's still on Big Sur. He he explained that in a oh, part of it in a okay. I, I, it, you didn't miss it. I took it out. Um, he's on Big Sur because he had some issues with uh, a FileMaker database that he didn't want to upgrade. Okay. Right. They Fair they enough. didn't want to upgrade at the time, but he did say, "Look, if if upgrading to a more recent OS is." is necessary as part of this. He's like, I don't mind the expense. It's like, we, yeah, need the only reason problem. I'm yeah. hesitating on, on that is because it probably doesn't, if you're having these issues, they're not going to go away by doing an overtop install of another operating system. That's kind of what I'm getting at. So like Got it. if some of the other recommendations you gave didn't work, depending upon, I mean, if he's just been doing over the top, over the top, over the top since he got the thing, I mean, I I fell in this camp where every three, four years, I would generally nuke and pave and just restart because you just build up crud over the yes. years. And it's a pain in the butt, and I hate doing it, and it's not fun. And I recommend it, you know, only in the most extreme circumstances. So I would try some of these other things like Dave's recommended, and if there's not a resolution there, then you might have to bite the bullet and try a nuke and pave like do all your backups make sure you've got the multiples and you know where everything is and you know where all your software is to reinstall and all that fun stuff but yeah yep nuke I, and pave <laughs> I, I will say that nuking and paving today is way less of a pain than it was even five years ago you know with so much of our data synced to the cloud it it a lot of more than I every time I do it, I dread it. Just like you said, it's like, oh, I don't want to I don't have a day for this, you know, and it only winds yeah. up taking a couple of hours, you know, yeah, yeah. and 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 I would be very if if let me put it this way, you know, if I were there on site with you and you were paying me by the hour uh, and I learned this when I did a lot of this, you know, on site by the hour, I would spend the first 20 to 40 minutes kind of tr trying the quick things, right? You know, and if we weren't getting anywhere and we were spinning our wheels, it's like, okay, wait, here we are 30, 40 minutes into this. We could stumble on the solution in the next five minutes. And that will remain true until we actually stumble onto the solution, which could be hours, but we're always potentially five minutes away from the answer and we might wind up spending five hours and not yet get there so i would always try to balance this with the customer and say we know that a nuke and pave is probably going to take about two hours you know or whatever we think it's going to take that's a that's a known 
the where the you know looking for this needle in the haystack is an unknown. So your choice, but I but you know I would I would advise them like if this were my computer, I I might spend another 15 20 minutes looking for the needle in the haystack and then I would punt on that and just get the job done. And yeah. there are additional benefits of nuking and paving that that are that go beyond this one problem, right? But I feel really confident in this scenario, knowing what we know, that a nuke and pave would resolve this. I could yeah, be wrong. I, I I've been wrong before. But yeah. The the main reason I did it, you know, again, I would do it if I ran into exactly this situation where it's like this problem. I'm just chasing it, chasing it. I can't figure out what's going on. That's one scenario. The other scenario, like I said, was like every fourth upgrade or something like that. I'd go, yeah, it's really just time. But it's a lot time. of that was about just cleaning house. Like it forces you to go through your system and be like, oh my god, I've got these apps that I haven't needed forever. I have all these documents that have just been sitting there. Let's get those off and archive those someplace else. Like it gave me an opportunity to like really assess like, oh my God, I pack ratted for, you know, four years and like 50% of this stuff could go and I wouldn't care. You wouldn't care. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, Kiwi Graham in the live chat brings up something that, that came to my mind and left it almost as quickly when I was first answering Andrew's question, which was he, he said, and I don't know if this was included, but he said he had a one terabyte drive with about 250 gigs used. Is that a spinning drive or is it an SSD? I am not sure if in 2019 you could still buy an iMac with a spinning drive, but if it is a spinning drive, that will have a performance impact, negative performance Huge impact. One, yeah. Yeah, on especially on database intensive operations, which is what searching is now, right? You know, so it oh, but right what size what size is the drive? One terabyte. If he has the base model, that's a fifty four hundred RPM SATA drive. Okay. So <laughs> I just checked Mac Tracker. Yeah. All right. I'm assuming he has the 4K Retina 2.5 inch. Because yep. I think that's the only one that offered the Core i3. Okay. All right. So and it's the early 2019 because they also did a 5K 27 inch in 2019. Correct. Yeah, I had the I had the 5K here. I still have the 5K. I, some something in me like has hope that it's just going to miraculously. Think, yeah, that's come a Core i5. So the Core i3 yeah. is the base model 4K 21 and a half inch, and the Base storage is a is a SATA drive. The other one terabyte option would be a fusion drive, which is still still spinning mostly drive. spinning. Yeah. Right. All right. So uh. new advice: <laughs> buy an SSD, connect it to the Thunderbolt port on that thing, and uh, and clone or well, cloning is not. Uh, could he clone with Big Sur? Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. If you can't clone. You know, re reinstall and, and migrate over to that. Uh, you, things are going to get faster, and that mach that will breathe new life into that machine for you. Uh, guaranteed. Yeah, I mean, you can carbon copy clone or whatever. Well, but right? you can't. You can't with Sonoma. Like you can't clone to a new boot drive. It, it ain't oh, quite as easy drive. as it used to be. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. But still, or if you're really brave, you know, you can open that thing up and put an SSD in it. But that's what I had to do with my wife's, yeah. uh, you know, we had an Intel Mac mini or whatever, and like it changed the world. Yes. Oh, uh, it, it, yes. Yes. I, we, I, you know, you can go back to the episodes. It's probably 12 years ago now or something on this show where we started migrating our machines to SSDs. And it was like, Oh, you know, fi finally our computers would use their CPUs. Yeah. yeah. Prior to that, it, everything was I.O. bound. It, you know, rarely did you see your Mac use its CPU. And then it was like, it got freed up the I.O. It was like, boom, good to go. Yeah. 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 Start there. Yeah. I, I would. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and just do the external thing because it's it's easy and fine. It's and, fine. and Thunderbolt and it's a, has plenty of the bandwidth that it, it's yeah. no, you're not. You're going to get so much more performance over the spinning drive internally, even though because like people start to freak out about the whole bus thing and it's not going to be your bottleneck. That's no, Believe that's me. not going to be your issue. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Kiwi Grim. This is one of the things I really love about the Mac Geek Up community in general and specifically about having so many of you join us when we 
do the show because these kinds of things come to mind. And I, I made the incorrect assumption. I could have checked Mac Tracker when I was answering Andrew's question, but I was like in like blazing through mode. I'm like, ah, there's no way they released a computer in 2019 that had a, a spindle drive. Well, Dave was <laughs> wrong. Told you I was wrong before and that I would be wrong again. Who knew? It's going to be right away. Uh, yeah, that's that's where I would start. For sure, especially since you've exhausted all these other things. I mean, you know, spending money is spending money. You don't want to do it willy nilly. But and I still think, you know, here's the thing. Unless you can clone to that, migrating to it will naturally cause you to do a reinstall of the operating system and then migrate things over with like, you know, migration assistant, which will work almost perfectly in most cases. So it really won't. Uh, hurt all that much yeah. but that's not a nuke and pave migration assistant is its own thing but it will get you there quickly that and that would be worth yeah. trying right yeah, you know it's just do it just do that yeah install the os on on the spindle drive let migration assistant take your data over or, sorry install os on the ss uh, install the new os on the ssd let migration yep. assistant slurp things over and my guess is that your your problems will be... your, your life will change and you'll yeah be like, you may not do this solve... sooner you may not solve the problem, but you might mitigate the symptoms of it this way. Yeah. 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 Hal has our next question. He says, and I'm curious about M1's future. I have three M1 Macs, a uh, Mac Studio, a 14-inch MacBook Pro, and an 11-inch iPad Pro. Okay. All M1 with one terabyte storage. Uh, I just use Lightroom for photography. That is all. I don't do any video editing. My question, how long will the M1 chip handle this basic photo editing and receive continued Apple support? Maybe uh, move up to the M3 or the M2. I still have a 2017 Intel iMac uh, and it's still going just fine. Yeah, great. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, he says it's a backup only. And Adam, I'm glad to have you here, says Hal. And I agree <laughs> with Hal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, glad to be here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thought, thoughts on uh, on this, Adam? Yeah, so my immediate thought was, I don't know how many people know about Apple's um, sort of terminology for either vintage or obsolete products. So bottom line is, I don't think you have to worry too much about M1 going away anytime soon because Apple has two things where they have vintage or, yeah, vintage products and um, obsolete products. Yep. And vintage products are basically covered in terms of like, you can take them to an Apple store, you can repair them, you can go to Apple service providers, they're going to have parts for them uh, for like five years. Uh, yeah, products are considered vintage when Apple stopped distributing them for sale so, more than five and more less than, five, than seven. Yeah, between right. five, and, five and seven years. Yep. And as we know, like operating system updates go back four or five years too. So like you're going to be able to upgrade your operating system for at least four or five years. Um, and then, you know, after seven years, that's when things get obsolete and that's when I would really kind of start to worry. But, you know, like M1 is still like a great processor. And if you were to buy one, I wouldn't even have any qualms about recommending to someone, especially who, someone who might be on a tight budget. You can still find M1 Max out there and you can get great deals on them and they're going to, oh. they're going to go for three, four five years. You're going to be just fine. Oh, I agree. Opinion. I, the the Mac Studio that I'm running here in the studio to replace the aforementioned lightning struck iMac uh, is an M1 Max. It's the base model Mac Studio with a 512 gig SSD, and it's great. I looked in uh, in Mac Tracker to see when this clock would start for the M1 in general, which I think is an important marker here, right? So the M1 Mini was sold up until January of 2023. The M1 Mac Studio through June of 23 and the M1 iMac was sold up until October of 23. So I think for M1 in general, October of 2023 is when this five year clock is going to start. I, I know that there were others that that stopped being M1 prior to that, but M1 is M1, especially with Mac OS. Right. Yeah. So October of 2023 that means we've got until fall of 2028 before Apple is off the hook for M1 in general. I think we're going to be all right for a while. 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I <laughs> I mean, I was going to mention, I, I guess we're going to talk a little bit later, so maybe I should save this. I'm going to save it for later, but I'll, okay. I'll talk about some of my technology that I still use a little bit later, I think. All right. I mean, okay, great. All right. Yeah. Well, um, sh- shall we, shall we proceed into later? Do you want to, you want to read Jim, Jim's question for yeah, us? Yeah, or? I guess it's not okay. that much later. <laughs> it's not that much later. Here we are. <laughs> yeah. Jim has a great size. He's, and it's actually for you, Dave. He says, Dave, I'm considering getting a Synology, Synology disk station. I can say that word with <laughs> the main use being backup and to stream media photos, videos for family and friends. I take a lot of photos and videos and share them with family and friends and groups I'm associated with. I have a few questions regarding this, and I'm hoping you can help answer. I'm sure Dave can. I would like to take photos, videos of events, and then post them for others to view or and or download. Can I allow access to a media folder with both videos and photos that others can view if they have a URL to access this folder? And can you share individual files? Can home videos be streamed? Would video station be used to stream share media files? Is there a cost for that software? Are the disk stations noisy, have running fan, or relatively quiet? I'm considering the DS423 with four bays, so I would have plenty of room for backing up files and sharing streaming media. I could use RAID 5 or 3 on the drives for backup and have one drive by itself sharing my media. Oh, can I? I think he's asking. Or do all four drives need to be set up on RAID 5? Or is that the best way to set it up? I currently have a Flickr account where I share my media files, but home videos are limited to size and length. I'd rather not pay an annual subscription for Flickr if I can do the same thing myself with no limit on streaming videos. Is Synology a good solution for what I'm trying to do? Or should I just stick with Flickr? I appreciate your feedback since you are familiar with the disk stations. I am all too familiar with the disk stations. I, I have a little story to tell about my 20-minute ordeal on Saturday afternoon that turned into six hours, but I'll, I'll, I'll save that uh, it, it, with, with my disk station. It was, this was a self-inflicted thing. Um, yes, so I, I think the DS423+, Plus, that's the model. There is no DS423, just for everybody's benefit if you wind up searching for this. I think the DS423+, Plus is a fantastic disk station for most of us here in the Mac Geek Gab community. It's got, like you said, it's got four bays. It's got a decent CPU in there to handle, like you can run some Docker containers on that CPU. You can run, you know, the things you want to run. It also, it is an Intel CPU with a GPU, which means it has the capability of doing hardware transcoding, which can be important, especially in your scenario where you want to provide videos for family and friends having the disk station able to do that hardware transcoding if they're on a bandwidth limited connection back to you super important so there's all like a lot of reasons that i love the ds423 plus really great disk station um i would as far answering your questions in reverse i would Almost always, unless there is an extenuating circumstance and nothing you described would fall into this category for me, I would always set up all of the discs as one array, one and and arguably one volume too. I wouldn't split the volumes. I would make one array of all the discs. I would not have one disc for media and the other three discs for whatever else you're doing Do all four of them or three of them or two of them. You don't have to fill it. Out of the gate, you can put two in, two discs in, and then add a third when you need more storage and add a fourth when you need more storage. Um, And I would not use RAID 5. You could, and there's nothing wrong with RAID 5 except that you can't use different size discs with RAID 5. If you you do, if you have, let's say you put two two terabyte discs in, let's say. Well, that if, if even if you call it RAID five, if you just have two discs, one disc is always dedicated to fault tolerance with RAID five, which means you would get two terabytes of storage and you would have one disc for fault tolerance. However, if you added a third two terabyte disc, you would have one disc for fault tolerance and now four terabytes available for your storage. If you then and we're still on RAID five, if you then added a four terabyte drive you would only add two more terabytes of storage. Two terabytes on that four terabyte drive would remain unused until 
you replaced all of the other three drives with drives that were at least four terabytes in size. So the smallest drive in the array defines how all of the drives are going to be seen. That is not true with something called Synology Hybrid RAID, or SHR as they call it. That gives you the option of using mixed disk sizes within one disk station, within one array. And for most home users is what I would recommend because it allows you the flexibility of kind of using drives that you get over time. And as you replace drives, you start replacing them with larger drives and over time your array will just grow. And that's wonderful. So that out of the way um, for video streaming. Yep. This device will do it. You can use video station or Plex. Even it's available for free. Uh, could be, and you can pay for additional features, but Plex, I, I would use Plex to do this, but you can run both Plex and video station on the same disc station pointing to the same media library. Like that. You don't have to keep two copies of your media library. You can literally have one. You point both, to, both of them to that folder and, uh, it works just fine. As for noise, so yes, the DS423 Plus is going to have a fan. And that fan can be set to like loud mode, medium mode, or quiet mode. The fan is not going to be your problem. That's relatively quiet and it's nice, consistent, easy white noise. Those discs that you put in there, however, are going to be a different story. Unless you choose to put SSDs in, <laughs> uh, those discs are noisy. Adam, you are you you have experience with this too? <laughs> well, yeah, because my Synology sits in our living room, and uh, oh, you know, my wife would be like, "What's that noise?" And I'm like, "It's yeah, <laughs> yep, <laughs> yep, <laughs> yep, okay. yep." It's the discs are noisy. When I moved the disc stations last year maybe a year before from my office to the kind of a, a basement closet in our house a uh, playroom closet really in our house simply because we put we put a generator in uh, like a, a standby generator in at the house and i thought well this is where now i where, where i want all the network stuff right. and uh it, it was it took me a, a couple of weeks to get used to the new much lower much more consistent ambient volume level in my office it was like something's wrong. Like I, I thought like it felt like the power was out, even though of course the lights were on and everything was fine, but yeah, it, those things are noisy. So if you can avoid putting it in your living room, that is a good thing and, and or your bedroom, but you could put SSDs in this and then all you would have is the noise of the fan. You'd also maybe have to just eat, ramen for a little while to <laughs> yeah, offset you know, the expense <laughs> second <you> mortgage <laughs> yeah exactly but um yeah you know it, like the answer to everything is yeah man this is what a disc station is for and it's a great entry point to getting a disc station it, you there's so much more you can do with it and the, as i said the 423 plus is super capable so you will you, and and Synology software, Synology software is really where they shine. I, we we actually have a lot of complaints, uh, comments perhaps about how their hardware is underpowered. It's sort of a known thing in the industry. The it, the 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 holy grail for all of us is Synology software and QNAP's hardware, right? Uh, that would be great. And it turns out we might get something approximating that from Ugreen. Um, the Ugreen brand new, not even in the market yet, uh, NAS Sync, N-A-S-Y-N-C, is, uh, is coming. I've been paying very close attention to this since CES. I actually had a conversation with them last week. I've got one on the way. But they're putting – they the people in charge of this project have worked at Synology. They've worked at QNAP, and they've worked at Seagate. So they know the and like they really understand what people like us want and they know that there's a gap in the market. So I'm eagerly awaiting to, I like I know right out of the gate the U Green one isn't gonna be right. So right now I wouldn't recommend buying it unless you want it to just tinker with. But over the next twelve months, as the software for this thing matures and everything kind of comes around it's going to start getting interesting. So anyway, that's a, that's a departure. The Synology software is great. It will, you know, it will give you 
as many Saturday afternoons of tinkering fun as you care to spend with it and, and tweak. And you can add all kinds of different little server things. It's super fun. So I, yeah, I think, I think you're going to have fun with it as to the last question. Is this easier than Flickr? No, Flickr's already working for you. There's no friction, no time, and just the annual expense of maintaining the status quo with Flickr. So I can't with a straight face say, of course, this is better. No, well, it's not easier. Whether it's better or not depends on whether, you, like I, for me, yeah, of course, I like hosting the stuff myself. I like managing it. I like tinkering with it most of the time. Uh, so, yeah. Hopefully that helps you. You which disk station we gotta we gotta upgrade you right? You have a, a, like 15, a 15, 13, 13 plus. How 15, many discs do you plus. have in that? Uh, I think four. Okay, think there's four. Because because maybe maybe we need to send you a, a four twenty three plus. That's kind and of. And I have I'm two thinking. two broken drive doors that we talked about. I gotta get yes. the little lat. I gotta order those. <laughs> well, you don't have to order them. Over. If uh, if we wind up getting you a four twenty three plus, because that might be the uh, the magic answer here. So. I, I was looking at that exact model. It was interesting yeah. that he brought that up. Yeah, but I run a lot of old technology around here. I realized, you know, we were talking earlier about when to in, upgrade to an, uh, you know, your Intel Mac. So I thought every time I've been in here, there's a, there's a fan noise, and I always thought it was my Drobo under the desk. And I went okay. and turned off the Drobo today. And I still hear the fan noise, and I'm like, Uh-oh. oh, oh, I had a I had a uh, a spinning backup drive that I use for just like a Seagate drive that I use for. And I'm like, Oh, I wonder if that has a fan in it. So I unplug that still a fan noise. It's my huh. Intel. It's my Intel. <laughs> it's oh, of course it like, is. Whoosh. Oh yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so there's that. Um, until I moved here two years ago, I was using a USB four bay Drobo, like an original Drobo connected to a, uh, Intel Core Duo, not even Core 2 Duo, Mac Mini as wow. a network backup yeah. storage facility. And it, it it was stuck running Snow Leopard, I think was the last operating system it would run on. But I was running that up until two years ago. And it's sitting in the box here. It would still run. I could probably hook it up and still do the same thing. I was using yeah, yeah. Um, Chronosync. And Chronosync has, I forget, I can't remember what it's called, but they have like a networking software right. that you can use to okay. go across the network and that works great. So, you know, I am the king of like holding on to old technology for way too long and continue to use it. But yeah, I mean, that Synology is running great too. It does everything I need it to do. And uh, the only complaint I had was I couldn't figure out Plex, but then what I didn't realize as we talked about on a previous episode is that I needed to update the core software. Um, because I didn't realize it wouldn't tell me that, oh, you're on six, you can now go to seven. It would it did the auto updates up within whatever version it was. Yes. And then yes. It, I didn't know I could even download and install like the You can greatest. run DSM seven on the fifteen thirteen plus? Yeah, I think That's so. That's amazing. That's great. It, it, that like Synology, their support is like their support for their devices is is amazing. Like the, like the fact that you can run the current operating system on these devices that are ancient and out of warranty and out of any sort of support, it, it, it speaks a lot to how they are as a company. And they, if you emailed them for support with that, I, like I, I would be almost certain that they would engage and answer and help you, even though it's way out of warranty. Like I've, I've had them go and we've heard this from all of you folks too. Uh, you know, they go out of their way for this. So yeah. yeah, it's uh, I'm running seven seven one one yeah whatever one 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 six it's amazing update six That's so amazing. and that brought my Plex back so now I'm happy like it's fine other than the little hardware failure. Yeah right, but but that's like physical hardware failure that your drive doors won't close. Yeah. 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 And I just I, took the empty ones and I've swapped them. <laughs> of course. Yes. <laughs> so they're just the empty bays that are popped open. <laughs> I, I had never heard of that until you mentioned it, you know, whatever, three, four, week, five weeks ago, whatever it was. And then I was doing an inventory of disk stations that I like old disk stations that I have here. And I was going through one of them and just making sure I hadn't left like a drive in it or anything before I, I gave Pete this, this old one uh, that he's now using for like a data storage thing, which is great. It's nice to see it back in service. And as I was going through, 
you know, I just pop the drives and put it, take it out, make sure there's nothing in the tray, pop it back in and lock it. And one of them, it was totally fine until I touched it and I opened it up. It was like, okay, great. And I close it and won't close. And I'm like, well, oh, that's-, that's weird. And, and then I was like, freaking Adam cursed me. Like I've never experienced this. I have, I've had so many disc stations over the years. And now I get this. Yep. Here's the thing with mine. They did it on their own. Like they were just sitting there and they just, one day I walked up and one was popped <laughs> open and I couldn't close it. And then yeah. about a month later, another one did it. Wow. And I was like, what the heck is going on here? Like they just failed on their own. Like no one touches that thing. No one goes over there. Like, right. I mean, unless the cats bumped it and then did it, but I highly doubt it. Doubt, anyway. I doubt it. Yeah. I, I will share a PSA oh. here about anyone migrating from one disk station to another. Something I have done countless times without any issues whatsoever. So much so that I'm super confident about the process and Synology makes it easy. If you have, let's say you have like, you know, three, a uh, uh, three bay array and whatever size disk station it might be, you know, it could be a four bay, it could be an eight bay. It doesn't matter. Uh, you can take those disks, move them into a new disk station fire it up and it'll say, Hey, uh, I see that you're moving this, uh, from a, you know, whatever you used to have to whatever this current model is. Do you want to do that? And you say yes. And then, and then it asks you another question. Do you want to start from scratch uh, with your system, but keep your data? Or do you just want to basically keep everything, including all your settings and your users and everything, and just run what you ran over there, over here without having to do anything else. And so, Obviously, I always choose that. And then it says, great, I'm going to download the software for it. It downloads the software, updates itself, reboots, and literally in like 20 minutes, you're back up and running. It's amazing, right? It's awesome. So on Saturday, we got home. We went out to lunch. We got home from lunch. And I'm like, you know, I, I've been wanting to roll one of my disk stations to a newer one that I have here. I need to test. Okay, great. I'm like, I, I told Lisa, I'm like, I don't even know if I told her I'm going to take 20 minutes, but in my, I, like, I knew it was going to be 20 minutes. So I'm like, yeah, I'm just going to do this. And so I go into the playroom. I, I shut down the old disk station. I had my laptop downstairs already. I was kind of thinking about doing this. And uh, I shut it down. I put the, um, you know, put the, move the drives. And the one thing, and I did this, I, this was not my problem. You have to put keep the drives in the same order. So drive one is drive one. Drive two is drive two. If you mess that up, that's on you. So <laughs> I, I was very, I, and I know this. I've done this many times. I'm very diligent. Okay, so I did that. Came up, got the screen, answered the question, starts downloading the software. The download is corrupted. What? Okay, well, fine, whatever. All right, let's do it again. You know, so back through download it, restart it, you know, find, come up that uh, starts downloading. The download is corrupted. Uh, okay. So I go to the website, I download the software manually because you can, you can do that too. You can, you know, it's all just in a web browser. So, okay. Again, one more time, I upload your system volume is full. Like, Oh no, I've heard about this. Oh no. So now I have, there's, there's your main volume that has, you know, Ter- terabytes and terabytes of data. And then there's a tiny little sliver that they carve out for the system volume and it's put on every disc. So if you lose a disc, you still have your system volume. It's a, it's a raid one. It's a mirror across all of them. And uh, that system volume was full. It turns out Synology used to. And so therefore my older raid uh, uh, has this size, 2.3 gigabytes of a system volume. The new ones if you were to set up a disk station today, it would give you an eight gigabyte system volume. I would argue it should be a hundred, but be that as it may, it needed about 750 megabytes to download and unpack, like unzip the update file. And, you know, things like if you know anything about Unix, var log is stored on the system volume. The slash user and slash Etsy directories are stored on the system. So there's like things there. And there's even some app packages there. I spent six hours on Saturday. And I, by, by hour five and a half to, to our previous story, I gave up. I was like, I cannot 
solve this. Um, and I texted Lisa. I, I started kind of keeping her up to date. Like, I'm sorry. Here's where we are. I, like, I hadn't even like gone upstairs since we got home from lunch. And, uh, and I'm like, I have two more things I'm going to try. It's going to take 15 minutes and then I'm done. And thankfully the first one of those actually worked, but it was, you know, it was just that constant process. I had to, I learned on Saturday how to hot mount a Synology volume in, I, I built like a new disk station with a single drive to just get it up and running. And then while it's on, I pushed all of my disks in from the old one and was able to hot mount the system volume that way. It was a whole thing. I learned more Unix than I wanted to learn. And I knew I was playing with fire, right? I Like I knew that anything I did could be the last thing I ever did with this volume, right? But thankfully, I was able to clear off enough stuff from that system volume to fix it. My advice to everyone is if you are... If you know how to go and check how much space is on your system volume, do that before you migrate to a new disk station. Definitely. You, you, and if you don't know how to do that, open a Synology support ticket. Tell them what you're about to do. It's going to take a few days for them to reply. Have them go in, look at your system volume, clean out. They will clean out the things that they know are safe to clean out. So you're not guessing like Dave was on Saturday afternoon. And you're and and have them prep you for this upgrade, and then and then then you'll be fine. Like if I had gone in in advance, this would have instead of being a twenty minute process, it would have been a twenty five minute process. Like it really would have been trivial if I knew how much space I needed and what to do to get there, which I now know. Uh, it it would have been fine, but instead. I did not proactively do this and I lost, you know, an entire Saturday afternoon. Um, sure. I learned some things and here's a valuable story and I can go tell Lisa. No, no, it was good. I talked about it on the show. Uh, but yeah. So be aware is, uh, and, and really engage Synology support if you're going to do this. So that's my PSA. So cool. Yep. 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 Um, but don't let that, don't let this dissuade you. <laughs> and they, they are aware of this problem. One thing that I noticed I have four disks in this array. Um, two of them have eight gigabytes reserved for the system partition. Two of them have 2.3. So my system partition is 2.3, as we talked about before. You know, it's a mirrored thing, so the smallest size wins. But once I replace the other two drives over time, my system partition on this array will grow to eight gigabytes. So, and if you were to start up a new one right now, you'd get eight gigs. And in theory, that's enough. I, I, again, I'd like about 50 or a hundred, just plenty of breathing room. Storage is cheap. Dave, you want to talk about Synology for a little bit? No. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you have a question? No. Okay. <laughs> Shall we do some cool stuff found, Adam? I think we should, hopefully. I agree. I agree. All right. Uh, listener Dave tells us about a new thing uh, that he found. It's called stash.new. He says um, it's a well-thought-out alternative for Google Docs. He says you uh, you just go to, well, you go to stash.new. Or stash pad, I guess you can go to either one. It seems I, I I went to um let me let me confirm this before I before I do the thing. Yeah, stash.new will bring you to docs.stashpad.com. Okay, so uh he says here are the number of steps to make a new shareable document in Google Docs. First, you gotta be signed in. Second, you gotta go to Google Docs, create a new document, share, make a title for it, save it, test it, go into the sharing thing change restricted to anyone with the link, copy the link and you're done. Okay. So he counted all that out. That's 11 steps. The number of steps to make a shareable document on stash pad in your browser type stash dot new number two, click the paperclip looking icon in the top and you're done three steps, including, and you're done, which was the 11th step in the other one too. <laughs> so uh, he says the speed of their site is remarkable and the learning curve feels like zero. I dug into this and he's totally right. It's a very cool alternative. I, of course, 
was wondering, okay, what's the longevity of this company? What's the privacy? Who are they? All of this. And thankfully, uh, Dave from Houston, but now living in Lisbon, Portugal, uh, had already done some of this work. And he says, uh, it's an early stage startup based in Durham, North Carolina, the other Durham, uh, one of the other Durham's. The founders used to be engineers at Twilio and Nextdoor. They're backed by Precursor Ventures and people who have helped build Twilio, Slack, Superhuman, GitHub, and others. Uh, so he says their privacy pages looked pretty good and all that stuff. So thank you for that, Dave. Yeah, fun stuff. Stash. Cool. New. Yeah, free. I, it's, or so it seems. So that's, you know, we like that. Free for now. <laughs> free for now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Porthos John is going to make us all spend some money. Uh, he says, I'm in one of our remote offices today. Uh, and when I arrived at the hotel, I realized that I brought my travel kit to charge my phone, watch and AirPods, but had forgotten my power adapter for my Mac and iPad off to Best Buy. I went and he says, I found the coolest, lightest, thinnest power brick with included two outlet extension that I have seen. He says it wasn't cheap, but it's easy to use. It's the anchor. It's the a nine one, two, six, one F one G A N prime hundred watt charging station regularly $65 on Amazon. He said that day it was 20 or $10 off. Um, now it's at $90 on Amazon. This thing I have the, uh, Oh, I guess actually, no, the one that he mentioned is still that there's a 140 watt version. So I have the one he talked about, which is this very cool thing. It's, it looks, uh, it's about the size of an iPhone and it it's it, like including its its thickness but it has on its face it has two three prong USAC outlets and what's cool is when you plug into one of them the outlet lifts out of the uh, adapters to to make it deep enough to plug into which is cool and yeah. then on the end it has two USB-C and two USB-A power ports as well. This is what I travel with. It I used this for all of the trips that I had recently, and I love it. It is it's exactly this. The 140 watt 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 one that he found, in addition to being 140 watts, has a screen on it that shows you how much power each port is consuming. And because it's going to be used in hotel rooms, the screen is not on all the time. It has a little button you can push. To, to turn the screen on and, of course, off so that you aren't stuck with this glowing, beautiful n n light of nerdness that uh, is going to be so delicious. So I definitely need to upgrade to this for the screen alone, uh, for sure. Like, there's zero question that I'll need this in my travel kit. And I'm, I'm bummed that I didn't know about it before I started my Q1 travel extravaganza because I, now I don't have a reason to use it for a little while. But I, but I will. There'll be there'll be more. So, eighty nine bucks for the one with the screen on uh, on Amazon. We'll put a link in the show notes. It's, it looks delicious. Yeah, it's worth it. It's it's first Friday. <laughs> it's first Friday. Yes. <laughs> and I know this because it's ten a.m. and the and the air raid siren just went off. Ah. So if anybody hears that, I apologize. We do hear that. Yeah, we have we have not. There's there was one time in the past where you mentioned that it was going off and we couldn't hear it, but um, this this time we get to hear it. So yeah, that anchor thing, right? Though, like, look at that. that oh yeah, yeah. I had something similar to that years ago. Not not with the USB stuff, but just a nice portable thing. Yeah, and it was great for carrying around, and I could share it with people in Starbucks and stuff like that. It was great. Yeah, look at that air raid siren. I love that. I love it. Um. We got time for more another cool stuff found or two. Listener Ben tells us about our next one. And uh, as soon as I find it here, I will pull it up. He says, my M2 Air has the tendency to be slow to reconnect to Wi-Fi after waking from sleep. This is odd to me since PowerNap works and evidence reveals that it has been connected during sleep. Nonetheless, I found some steps in an article Uh to build a sleep watcher automation that power cycles my Wi-Fi on every wake of my MacBook Air, and the problem is solved. And so we will um, we will link to this sleep watcher thing. It's a uh, sleep watcher is a, a command line tool that monitors the sleep, wake up, and idleness of a Mac, and can be used to execute a Unix command. 
which of course can then trigger, you know, a shortcut or whatever you want um, from there. So that's, that's, and we've got links to sleep watcher and then also to the script that Ben found to, uh, to, you know, to, that, that, that actually does the, the, the swapping of the, or the toggling of the Wi-Fi. So thank you for that, Ben. I love, I love nerdy things like that. See, only one of our cool stuff found today so far is going to cost any of us any money. So that's not bad, right? Oh uh, yeah, that's good. I'm just wondering how long this, <laughs> this siren goes for. <laughs> um, I will share one other cool stuff found that I will audible into our ever growing list of cool stuff found. I was talking to our friend Jeff Gamut last night and uh, he was talking about text blaze, which is in a sense, a, like a text expander type tool where it, but it's got so many extra things in it. It's got like, um, templates and scripting and he says it's like it's what he always wanted text expander to be so uh i figured i would share that here too i i have not used it yet but it sure looks pretty interesting so we will we will put that in the show notes too so yeah i love things like that i i still use text a combination of text expander and um apple's built-in text expansion thing uh, i like yep. apple's built-in one because it's part of my ios keyboard by default but um for the advanced stuff i use text expander i'm surprised that i haven't moved any of that into keyboard maestro huh. you know just because yeah. it's always running for me keyboard maestro is so you know. yeah i use the same combo um i still have the text expander keyboard on my iOS devices and use it a little bit. I, I wish Apple would fix that. Like, I don't know if they can. Right. Um, you know, the not separate keyboard thing, but um, I mean, on my Mac. Yes. Right. T text expander all the time. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Text expander is there all the time on the, on the Mac. It, it can only be there with a separate keyboard on iOS or you can launch the app and, and the app is even more full featured. Like if I need to do a, a one of those things with fill in forms or whatever, the app is, yeah. is absolutely the way to go. Um, but, uh, and there is no keyboard maestro app for iPhone. So perhaps that answers my own question as to why I haven't moved this stuff yeah. into keyboard maestro. But, um, but yeah, 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 yeah. I, I like the Apple stuff for the simple things. Cause it's always right there. Like, you know, phone numbers, email addresses, those sorts of things. Uh, yep. I, I highly recommend building, snippets for that so all right for those hold on for oh, those yeah. playing at home four minutes is how long that air <laughs> <laughs> i i think if they were actually playing along at home they would have calculated that already <laughs> and that's the tornado warning siren so ah we and appreciate it, it. it yeah and it happens once per once per month just to yeah, test it the first yeah. friday of every month at 10 a.m all right they run that thing and it's yeah, loud because yeah. again it's about 200 yards from my house so, and it spins around, so it gets uh, louder when it points towards me, and then uh, less louder when it goes. It Dopplers. Yeah. yeah. And it sounds just like a World War II, you know, yeah. air raid what? bomb siren. I, is, is, it, is, it, is it an old world, like a repurposed Probably. World War II? Like, I mean, <laughs> it, you know, why wouldn't it be, right? When in, um, in our town that I grew up in, we had a volunteer fire department, and I think they still do, and so... They would, you know, they would, they would test that occasionally. And then also there were times where it wasn't a test, but right. I got so used to hearing it that I like, it wouldn't, it, I wouldn't even register. I'd have a friend over at the house and be like, what is that? What do you mean? Oh, that, oh yeah, that's the thing. They're like, what do you mean? What do you mean? It's like super loud. Cause again, <laughs> we were about as close to it as it sounds like you, you are to yours, but I was like, yeah, yeah. no, that's just fine. Fine. Yeah, it will be important for us if a real event happens because we don't have a basement, so right, uh, we have to go just a block over to the police station, basically security mm -hmm. center, and they have a shelter there. So oh, that's good. Knock on wood, we've not had to do that. The only time I ever hear it is first Friday, and that's when I hope I only ever hear it. Let's hope it stays that way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that that right. house that I grew up in, we also had a bomb shelter in our basement. 
it was, you know, the house was built in the forties. So it was like, they thought that that would help protect against like, you know, nuclear attack. Obviously we've, we've learned a little since then, but seemed like a good idea at the time. So we had this little bomb shelter, you know, just more cement. That's all out here in, I think it's in a more Western South Dakota. And I forget where the place is, but there is a company that is now selling. We had the largest munitions storage facility in the entire United States, and it's now been decommissioned. Yep. And some company bought it, and they're selling out them as shelters because they literally oh. are will survive a nuclear bomb kind of shelters. So it's yeah. interesting. That's interesting. They just sell, sell the empty shell, and then you can do whatever you want on the inside, and they're building a whole community huh. out there. So That's cool. Huh. <laughs> all right i guess it's if that time it. <laughs> yep time to bring the band in thanks for hanging out with us everybody thank you for sending in all your stuff to feedback at macgeekgab.com. right adam uh yeah that is feedback at macgeekgab.com. <laughs> it's feedback at macgeekgab.com. thanks to cashfly for providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you Make sure uh, you missed hearing Pete on the show this week, so make sure to go listen to his show, So There I Was. Uh, they just hit their 100th episode, which is absolutely amazing. And thanks to, uh, or not thanks, well, thanks, yes, but congratulations to uh, Dave Ginsburg uh, for the th- for hitting the 300th episode of In Touch with iOS. That's pretty oh, amazing. Cool. I know. That. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So go check that out, too. We'll put links to all these things in the show notes for you. Uh yeah, that's it. Thanks for hanging out. We'll uh, we'll see you next week. And thanks to our sponsors. Of course, you can always learn about our sponsors at MacGeekUp.com slash sponsors. And that has all the links for everything. And today, of course, LinkedIn.com slash MGG and BareBones.com. So our thanks to them. Our thanks to you. It really does help us if you go check them out. And uh, that's it. Yeah. Adam, I know my shirt says that uh, I'm routinely disruptive and that your shirt is flannel. Pete's not here with his shirt. What, what does his shirt usually say? I always, I forget. Oh man. Um, ah, don't get caught. Made That's some good advice. Later.